Good morning and welcome to this week's programme, an edition in which we pay tribute to the late Joan Sutherland, the voice of the century. The great soprano, her beginnings in Australia, coming to London, to Covent Garden, her apprenticeship in the 1950s, learning her trade, her craft, her art, and looking back on her remarkable career in opera in an interview with Patrick O'Rourke. It was the Italian critics, after she sang in Venice, who gave Joan Sutherland the title La Stupenda. We'll fade that recording there, but we will conclude this morning's programme with the complete recording. Joan Sutherland died in October last at her home in Switzerland, aged 83. The occasion of this archive interview is the inauguration of Veronica Dunn's singing competition for young Irish singers at the National Concert Hall in 1995. Joan Sutherland generously agreed to be an adjudicator and spoke on that occasion to Patrick O'Rourke. The only problem is that, that some of the contestants seem to become professional competition goers, but um, I certainly would, would have been unable to, to further my career if I had not entered the competitions. And these days, of course, everything costs so much more that a valuable prize is a great help to a young singer for going abroad, for studying languages, for helping um, in any way to, to, to further them in their, in their pursuit of, of uh, a career. And when judging young singers in competition to win bursaries, prizes, scholarships to help further their career, what qualities did she look for? I, I never really look for the finished article, but I certainly look for somebody who, who has personality, somebody who has a certain pizzazz on, when they walk on to the, to the stage or whatever it is, wherever it is we're holding the, the, um, um, the preliminary uh, run of the, of the competition. Um, they have to have something that... that makes contact with the audience, something that, that goes out from them, the feeling that, that they are singing because they love to sing, because they, they, they want to um, entertain the people that are out there. They have to have life in the voice. They have to have, it doesn't matter what the voice, how good the voice is, if, if, if they don't project some sort of life in themselves and, and, and life to the audience, they have, that's something that they have, that they, that they have to learn. And um, one doesn't always expect to, to have the finished article, but, but one does like to see that there is something there besides just vocal ability. When Joan Sutherland died last October, the critics spoke of her astonishing technique during her long career. Her voice from a low G to effortless flights above high C. Anthony Tomasini in the New York Times said of her singing that she could spin lyrical phrases with elegant legato, subtle colourings, expressive nuances, her sound warm, vibrant and resonant, without any forcing. Here she is in her career-defining performance from Donizetti's opera as Lucia, the trusting, unstable young bride. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, that's a studio recording, but it drew a thunderous 12-minute ovation 50 years ago in 1961 on her debut at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, where she was to give 223 performances. We regard you as the great interpreter of the bel canto style, um, the, the art, of course, of beautiful singing. Podrick O'Rourke is putting the questions here to Joan Sutherland in 1995. Is there any particular element or any particular elements in that style which uh, you would say are quintessentially necessary uh, if, if one is to have a success in, in, in that style of singing? I think that the voice has to run on oiled wheels. I think it has to be capable of, of singing slow, slow recitative, slow legato line, um, beautiful phrases. This is something that's very important in competition. You like to hear people phrasing instead of singing isolated notes and so many of them do they just sing notes and there is no phrase to cover the the the, 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 the beautiful musical swell um, you have to have getting back to Volcanta you have to have um, incredible agility you have to have a, a really beautiful seamless sound you have to have um, the same quality of voice from the bottom of the voice to the top and back again you have to have incredible breath control because some of the phrases are very long and the coloratura passages you have to be able to to invent variations um, not to startle the, the, the conductor by giving him something that he hadn't heard before but these all these things have to be worked out and and um, you have to have that that stability and determination and I, I, I really I don't know I, I you have to have everything I think <laughs> It sounds as if uh, a singer must be a really a, an athlete in, in many ways. Well, I've always thought of it as being a, a, um, like an athlete training. You, you, have to have, um, you have to overcome nerves. You have to accept telling by the conductor. You have to accept telling by the producer or stage director. You have perhaps to dance. You have to um, roll on the floor sometimes. You have to die. You have to swoon. You, have, you, you, you really... Are, are, are a, a type of athlete. Born in Australia, she had the advantage of coming from a family interested in music. Your mother, I know, was a splendid singer. Was this where it all began for you? Well, I certainly was exposed to it. She was not a professional singer, but um, it was a gorgeous mezzo-soprano voice, and um, I was, I was. I was well on the way because she'd studied the, the methods of um, Garcia and Marchese and was a, a real bel canto mezzo soprano. Mm. So, after the, winning the Mobile Quest uh, competition uh, and with uh, a generous donation, I think, from an uncle, you were able to come to, to uh, Europe to study and you arrived in London with your mother. Uh, with one big ambition. The ambition was to get into Covent Garden. But I, didn't, I didn't care what I did. I mean, I would have sung in the chorus, but th that was the ambition. That was the overriding ambition. But that didn't happen immediately. No, I, I had a letter of introduction, which was a pretty good one from Sir Eugene Goosens, and um, I, I took it to Clive Carey, who had been out in Australia for some years um, teaching out there, and he said, I think you'd better come to the College, Royal College of Music Opera School for a year. While you do your auditions, he said. And I said, but I, I you know, I, I, I didn't come from a from a conservatorium. I had no no college training at all. He said, we can we can we can work that. That'll be all right. I think you'll be acceptable to the to the opera school. And and it was a great help. Uh, and I did my auditions and finally was accepted. I think clinched by the end of the year production at the college, which was Il Tabaro. <laughs> and I was seeing Giorgetta. It is Giorgetta, isn't it? <laughs> so you joined uh, the company at the princely sum of £10 a week. That's and right. And Went much further then. <laughs> and £15 a week, of course, when you were on tour. Oh, definitely. Yeah. It made all the difference. And this is where you met Veronica Dunn. That's right. Yeah. And uh, I think she... she oh, we had some wonderful laughs. We, there was a, a group of us all around about the same age. We had some wonderful times. We used to laugh about our digs. We used to laugh about the, um, our um, putting on our makeup and so on. We, we, we had really wonderful times. I think it was, it was great that there was a company like, like um, Covent Garden was then. Um, today, I think it's harder for young singers. We had what, what was really a great type of, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Apprenticeship, in, in that we were, we were singing small roles, some big roles, 
but we had the cover of, of knowing that we were earning a, a weekly salary. And although one, one time you might be singing the High Priestess in Aida, and another time you'd actually be pushed on to sing Aida, it, it, it was great experience. And today that doesn't exist. I had seven years of that before I was able to d- do something like Lucia. And I, I don't regret one minute of it. Joan Sutherland believed that some of the great sopranos of the past would not have been engaged by modern producers because they did not conform to what the public now expected from a soprano. Well, I was always a rather large person, and I don't think I was taken too seriously when I sang some of the bel canto um, arias for my auditions at Covent Garden. I think they looked at me and thought, well, here's a, here's a replacement for Sylvia Fisher, who was the big Wagnerian singer at the time. I think they thought, you know, we can train this one up to be a, um, a Helvega or even an Isolde, and, and uh, we, that would be a good idea, put her in the Strauss and Wagner repertoire, but um, that was not to be. And I had to be very careful of, of of keeping my weight down. I, I had to, for a long, long time, I ate nothing but grilled meats, salad with no oil, and uh, tried to attend to the size of my, my body. Um, I ended up singing things like Lucia and, and the frail people like, like Marguerite and Faust and Gilda and so on. It, it, today, I don't, think I, I don't think I would be given, a, given work. I think today that people are very conscious of a, of a very glamorous looking person for a production. They don't always think about the voice that's, that's got to sing it. So that's a retrograde step in your opinion, this, the search for the... I, the, I think the it's unfortunate. I mean, I think back to people like the Konetsny sisters who were huge. They, were still ha- they still had magnificent voices well into their 60s. And um, to me, there was nobody, nobody, there is nobody like that today. The, the quality of the, of the sound was so, so wonderful and sweet and pure. Um, but today, I, I, I'm sure they would not be engaged. Um, it's very difficult, and unfortunately, with, with all the junk food that's available now, a lot of the young singers do tend to be rather tubby. Well, during those seven years, you had the advantage of working with the, the best repetiteurs available in the garden. Oh, that's, that is true. But you had an added advantage, because uh, Richard Bonney, who later, of course, became your husband, uh, was also working with you, and he had the foresight to see that your voice would be a perfect vehicle for the roles in, in the operas of Donizetti and Bellini and so on. That's right. Um, I, um, I didn't have as much confidence in me as he did, but um, gradually he bent me to his will <laughs> 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 and proved to me by, by tricking me. I, I, I had, have, have relative pitch. I don't have perfect pitch. And so he would send me away from the piano and, and raise everything, even the arias, not just, just scales and exercises. He would... He would, he would um, transpose all, all, the, all the pieces and then say, there you are, you see what, come here, come here, you see what you were just singing? And of course everything was, was way up here. <laughs> Only trouble is that he transposed a, a handle aria once when I was doing a, a concert in Rome. And I ended up, you know, I, I felt, the, what's the matter with my voice? Everything's so difficult tonight. He'd raised it. He'd, he'd, when he'd, he was playing without music and, and when, he, when he did the middle section, he transposed incorrectly and it went, <laughs> it went up, I think it went up a third. He said it was a fifth. I don't think so. I couldn't have managed it. But I, I sort of, you know, I, 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 I went, went along with him. I thought, oh, I've made a mistake, you know, and I, and I sort of gradually felt the voice going up and up and up, and I thought, oh, dear. <laughs> was this, this work on your voice and, and the, the change of focus, if you like, on your career, was that a very difficult time for you? Uh, no, I don't think so. I you think did. some people thought it was. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I, 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 I was happy in the fact that I was at Covent Garden and I was doing a lot of work for the BBC um, and it, it, was a, it was a wonderful time really. Well the, the events of uh, the 17th of February 1959 are pretty well documented <laughs> by now. You had arrived with a bang, an overnight success, uh, I think as you said after 15 years in the business. <laughs> um, so, um, and international stardom was now beckoning but I think you admit you had a problem and the problem was repertoire, and I think it, it, it really was connected with the fact that most of what you'd sung at the garden had been in English. That's right, absolutely right. So anything I did had to be learned in, in Italian or in the original language. And although I had done things like um, uh, Gilda and uh, Tales of Hoffman, all, all heroines and so on, everything had been in English. So I, I was stuck with, with learning a new, new type of repertoire and in foreign languages. And did you have a facility for languages? Not really, no. Um, I've absorbed a lot more on, on the way along. But um, I had studied French at, at school, and I had certainly looked at Italian. I had, had 
done a bit of Italian um, work with some of the repetiteurs in, in Covent Garden. But on the whole, I, I didn't have a grasp of the language at all. And to suddenly be sort of put into, into uh, the Fenice and Venice and, and La Scala and not really being able to string any Italian together at all, um, I was very glad to have Richard there, who was capable. And, and of course, I worked with Zeffirelli, who spoke English very well and helped. Um, but gradually, one learned. <laughs> <laughs> and what of keeping her voice in shape? Coughs, colds, and sinus problems? So I had very, very bad sinus problems, yes, and even had an operation after I'd had the success with Lucia. Uh, the doctor just said, you can't get through another winter like that. Um, in you go. And, and uh, didn't realize until after, he, after he'd done the operation that he was worried that, that when they removed the, the tubes for the um, anesthetic that, that they might have nicked the vocal cords. But everything was all right, but he didn't tell me until afterwards, <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> but this is an aspect of the profession which I think the public really doesn't appreciate very much. Well, I mean, one, one knew that, that uh, there were people all around you coughing and sneezing, and you, one had to travel in the, in the underground, you couldn't afford taxis all the time, and, and one sort of coped with it, really. But um, I sang many times when I, had a, when I had colds that I shouldn't have sung with. It's, it can do a great deal of damage, but I sort of knew when I should and shouldn't sing, and I didn't cancel very much, really, in spite of problems. Do you think it's more difficult for women uh, to have a professional singing career than it is for men? Um, I don't really think so, no. I think that a woman's got the advantage insofar as her voice can be very much placed at an early age, whereas a man has to cope with... with uh, changing from a voice soprano to his voice breaks and he has then to the possibility that he won't sing at all or in fact that, that he, he has to relearn how to sing. Um, the voice doesn't stabilize as quickly, I don't think. Um, and a man has to think of probably of, of supporting his, his family if he's married and so on. I, I think it's, it's probably more difficult for a man, mm. I would think. Well, women sing more naturally, of course, I think, than men. I think that's, uh, that's taken for granted. But you have the added pressures of, of uh, family life if you're married and perhaps children and so on. I mean, you, you had children. Well, I had, had just one son, but um, we coped. I was very lucky in, get, in, in getting an au pair girl who came for two years and still with us. I mean, my son's 40 in two years' time. So she's been with us 38, 39 years. Um, well, you, you, it, it is a lonely pursuit being a professional singer, but you've, you've been lucky in that your husband has been involved in the business with you. And you oh, indeed. That's been, that's been a great plus. Um, it, it, was, it was lonely traveling around by oneself, you know, to, to even you know, in, within Britain, going to, to Manchester or Birmingham to sing with the orchestra or whatever. You know, Richard couldn't always come. In fact, one couldn't afford to always spend the, 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 have the double fares and so on. But... Um, the fact that we, we ultimately did travel together and work together so much. I mean, we, we used to learn all the, all the roles together. And so when he was able to conduct the, the, the operas with me, it, it cut down on the amount of work I had to do with him when we were rehearsing. I then had, could, could just cope with what the producer was telling me to do because he knew what I was going to do and I knew what, he was, what his thoughts about the opera was, so, were. So it, it, it cut the work to a certain extent. And it was the, it was the companionship of... of being together. You retired from uh, actively singing, uh, I think, about four years ago now. Can you look back and appreciate what you've done in a, in a different light now? Well, I, I, I can at least listen to myself on records, which is something I couldn't do when I was still singing. I, I, I quite, quite enjoy to, to hear what I did sometimes, but um, it was a great career. It was a wonderful life. I, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. Not, not at all. It was, it was absolutely wonderful. We had a, a great, great time. And um, it was, I think, the thrill and excitement of, of giving people enjoyment. Sometimes I even, especially singing with Marilyn Horne, we, both of us even felt that we were levitated sometimes with, 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 with the, the sort of intake of oxygen and, and the out, outgoing sort of 
sound and, and, and with, with, with singing in thirds so much together. You know, we used to get this vibration in, in our heads and you really felt as though you were taking off. It was, it was quite incredible. And, and the, the, the head seemed to, to, to feel as though it was, it was expanding somehow. It's it, amazing sensations. And it was, it was thrilling. It was a wonderful, wonderful sensation. And with Pavarotti as well, with all these, with Domingo, with all the, 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 these great people. It was, it was a wonderful, wonderful life. And what of the future of the bel canto tradition? Are you happy that the modern singers are able to take up the torch you carried and hand it on to them? Well, we, I mean, we have a, a point in case, that, a case in point, I'm getting back, back to front, um, with, with the competition here. Um, it's amazing the, the, the ability of some of the young singers. I think that, that there's a, um, there are great young voices around, and there are, it's amazing how many there are in, in, in Ireland, it would seem. Um, there seems to be, there seem to be more mezzos than, than sopranos, um, but um, we've all had a, a, a very lovely time sort of listening to, to all the voices. Um, there's a lot of good bel canto singing there. And as I promised when we faded this earlier in the program, we will conclude with this from Gounod's Romeo and Juliet after Shakespeare, Joan Sutherland as Juliet, Covent Garden. 1960. <laughs> 
That programme is presented and produced by John Bowman and is repeated on our digital service, RTE Choice, every Thursday afternoon at 2. Hello, Peter Brown here to tell you about the rolling wave this Sunday night. We'll have a special programme visiting the National Folklore Collection, who are based in Dublin. In youth. Hello, Peter Brown here to tell you years. I'm going to hear about their work of collecting and preserving folklore, including traditional Irish music and song, and the value that people get from this. And the rolling wave is at 10pm this Sunday night here on RTE Radio 1. So, you suffer from repetitive heartburn? So, now there's Somac Control. Somac Control reduces acid production, giving you up to 36 hours of heartburn relief. Somac Control helps treat the cause of your heartburn. Somac Control. For heartburn, there's nothing stronger without prescription. Available from your pharmacist. Contains pantoprazole. Always read the label. Hobbs Law states that you should never pay a single cent more than you have to for directory inquiries. That means no to higher prices and an almighty yes to 11890 prices. 11890, fast and friendly directory inquiries. See 11890.ie. It's not that I'm saying everything is all right. There's no tidy all right anywhere in this world. A young widow heads for London to start afresh, but finds she can't leave the past behind. But I live richly here in my head. Radiators hiss when they are bled by Marie McSweeney is your short story tomorrow night after News and Sport at 11. And coming up after news and the papers, we'll have Sunday Miscellany on 88 to 90 FM on digital and online. This is RTE Radio 1. It's 9 o'clock. G News on Radio 1 with Michael Murphy. Good morning. The headlines. Police in Arizona have said that a U.S. congresswoman was the target of a gun attack last night in which six people were killed. Trocura is marking the anniversary of the earthquake in Haiti to call for stronger leadership from the government there. And widespread frost and black ice are reported in the Midlands and in parts of Munster. A United States congresswoman remains in a critical condition in hospital, having received a bullet in the head during a public meeting in Tucson, Arizona. Six people were killed in the attack, including a nine-year-old girl and a judge. More than a dozen others were wounded. Police said that the congresswoman, Gabrielle Giffords, was the intended victim. She's undergone brain surgery, and doctors there are confident she'll recover. A former Arizona senator, George Cunningham, who has known Gabrielle Giffords for many years, gave this update of how her treatment was progressing. She came out of surgery, she was responding to commands, and that uh, it appears as though uh, there will be recovery. Now we don't know, you know, what level of recovery, but there will be recovery, and we're, all, we're thankful that uh, many of our prayers have been answered. A 22-year-old man suspected of having been the gunman is in custody. Police are looking for a second man who may have driven the attacker to the scene. Witnesses say the gunman was wrestled to the ground by two bystanders after firing up to 20 shots from a semi-automatic pistol. President Obama described the attack as a senseless act of violence. Arizona's Republican Party Senator John McCain said he was deeply shocked by what had happened. The shooting of Congresswoman Giffords and the deaths of other individuals is a terrible tragedy and one that has shocked me and our nation. Icy conditions are again making driving conditions dangerous in some areas. The worst affected parts of the country are West Clare, Tipperary and Kilkenny, Leash and Offaly, Meath and West Meath. Widespread frost and black ice are reported from the Midlands and from Munster. The weather forecast. Frost and ice will clear gradually to give a cool day with sunny spells. However, there will be scattered rain or hail showers in parts of Ulster and Connacht. Highest temperatures of 3 to 8 degrees. Cold this evening with frost developing in many areas. The news and weather with the time at 3 minutes past 9. Here now with it says in the papers is Valerie Cox. Proclamations from Paradise. As record numbers of patients suffered on trolleys, 1.3 million VHI subscribers faced fee hikes and over 5,000 were diagnosed with swine flu. Health Minister Mary Harney issued statements from this five-star hotel in Thailand. 
That's what the Sunday Tribune says this morning over a photo of the Peninsula Hotel in Bangkok. Mark Hilliard has the details and the paper's editorial says, Minister Harney, if you don't care, go now. It was surely within Harney's power to book her holiday so that it did not clash with a time period that is notorious for health service mayhem, it says. The minister is on holiday, and that is her entitlement. But with the clock ticking down on her political career and the prospect of long, uninterrupted days ahead of her following the election, an early return to work was not too much to ask, says the editorial in the Sunday Times. Back to the front of the Tribune now, and a major Garda probe has been launched after up to seven senior government figures were the target of an anthrax hoax last month. The ministers and former Taoiseach Bertie O'Hearn were posted envelopes containing a white flake-like substance and an accompanying handwritten note stating, Have a happy Christmas. In some cases, it warned them to beware. And Fianna Fáil makes the lead for the Sunday Independent. Taoiseach Brian Cowan will be told to stay away by many Fianna Fáil candidates in the general election, as the party faces a meltdown at the polls greater than even the most pessimistic commentators had anticipated. And last night, in a surprise development, Fianna Fáil TD Ned O'Keefe called on Mr Cowan to resign, stating that he had lost the confidence of the public. The Taoiseach also features in the lead story for The Times under the headline Fitzpatrick Breaks His Silence. Sean Fitzpatrick, the former Chief Executive and Chairman of Anglo-Irish Bank, has revealed that he played golf and had dinner with Brian Cowan in July 2008.